Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. In the famous words of my boy DJ Khaled, there ain't no secrets at all. There ain't no secrets at all in this game. And if you pay close enough attention to the Georgia football program, and I mean really close attention, you'll find a few keys to the ultimate success that they've had on the college football level over the last couple of years. We can laugh all up and down about the Shane Beamer quotes. I think they're hilarious. I think it's hilarious when an SEC coach comes to the podium and says, well, of course, they got a billion five stars over there on the defensive side of the football. And it is true, they have had great players, and they do have great players under Kirby Smart. But having great players isn't the key to success. In fact, there's no one key to success. There's no one key to success that has created the success that Georgia has had. It's the entire machine, right? It is the talent. It is the coaching. It is the culture. But I'll tell you, every single time I'm in that building, and I am very thankful I've had the opportunity to, to have a, a different level of access this fall. Every time I'm in that building, I feel like I learn a little bit more as to why, as to why they are as successful as they are. So what did I learn today? Well, I learned today that Georgia's offensive coaches game plan together. They game plan collectively and not game plan together like we all sit in the war room and we all kind of watch the opponent and we all kind of openly, you know, uh, express our opinions of what we're seeing on the film. That's what every coaching staff does. No, what Georgia does is they specifically hand out responsibilities to each individual uh, position coach and they make that specific position coach responsible for that specific portion of the game plan every single week. Now, of course, the coordinator ultimately has the final decision, what gets in the play, uh, you know, what gets in the uh, game plan, what doesn't, what the final cut ultimately looks like. But the collective effort is indeed a collective effort, so much so that specific coaches have specific responsibilities within the game plan. I heard Glenn Schumann talking about this on Tuesday as well. This idea that there's a humbling process once you become a coordinator at the University of Georgia, a humbling process that requires you to depend upon others. It requires you uh, to think about what others think about the situation at hand, right? To take other uh, observations, if you will, and consider them. It's interesting, as I was writing this opening, I thought more and more about the, the diction, the words, the, the, the syntax that Kirby Smart's used over the last couple of years during the very specific national title success. They've always had top five success since he's been the head coach after that first season. They've had great success, but the penultimate, the winning a national title, what has changed since then? And I'll be honest, I was looking for the words that he has said, and I landed upon the words he hasn't said. Okay, used to, before Georgia was winning national titles, I heard Kirby Smart say this one thing over and over and over again, particularly when talking about offensive football. We have to play Georgia football. We have to play Georgia branded football. And you know, I've stopped hearing him say that over and over again. You know, what does Georgia do now? Georgia is constantly evolving. Georgia is constantly improving upon what Georgia football is. Georgia football has not stayed stagnant since 2021. They are constantly evolutionizing. They are constantly changing. They are constantly adding in. The last thing we hear nowadays when talking about Georgia football is, well, that's just the way we do it around here. We hear a lot about standards, but when it comes to schematical football and how we are playing offense and how we are playing defense, that staff does not talk about sticking and remaining in one facet. They bring on more help. They bring in more coaches than you could ever imagine. And this is not something that has always been about Kirby Smart's motto. This has not been him. In fact, he had a very strong and staunched identity for a while. And now you get into a point where the better never rest mantra makes a whole lot more sense, right? University of Georgia has not rested since winning a national title. Everything at the University of Georgia right about now is the key to success. Welcome into tonight's show. We got a great one for you, as usual. We got a load one for you. We're gonna talk a little bit about both coaches' press conferences today. Got a chance to talk to Mike Bobo and Dale McGee. Gonna talk about how the offense 
was always designated to change this year entering the uh, offseason, no matter the offensive coordinator change. Mike Bobo, Todd Munkin, be damned. They were going to look different this fall. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to bring you a, a multiple of concepts of the day. I think what we do around here in terms of teaching football is bar none. Uh, you know, there isn't much close to it, in my opinion, on this uh, YouTube place that you guys are watching us today. So we're going to teach you a little football with some concepts today. We're going to talk about Georgia's unique practice strategy that's led to the retention of great players at the University of Georgia. Kirby Smart talked about that 2021, that COVID baby class. He talked about uh, 18 of 21 players still remaining around. And a lot of those 18 players, guys like Xavier Sori, David Daniel, uh, Connor, uh, uh, Brock Vandergriff, right? Guys that haven't had an opportunity to play, that have stuck around. And I believe Georgia's unique practice style has played into that. Obviously, the first scrimmage is coming up on Saturday, and we want to talk to you guys about that. But I want to give a quick shout out today to Prize Picks. We got an NFL football kickoff game, or a, a, a NFL football game kicking off in a matter of minutes right now okay so run over to prize picks right now prizepicks.com pull up the app while you're watching us okay sign up today use promo code brooks they'll give you a hundred percent deposit match right meow okay you put a hundred dollars in they'll match you a hundred dollars on the spot i got a lock for you right now my second one since the new studio okay uh, i believe the seahawks play tonight the broncos play tonight the patriots, patriots play tonight there's a bunch of good football teams uh, playing tonight and a bunch of easy locks available for you on prize picks like this one right here. Hey, speaking of locks, Drew Locke, 131 passing yards today. I'm going to take the under. I was telling Jonathan before the game or before the show, if you told me Drew Locke was going to start on an actual game day on Sundays and the line was set at 131, I'd be a little finicky on that one. A preseason game in which he's not going to take all the snaps. Give me the under there. Hey, Bailey Zappi, good football player, 106. Shouts out to the Hilltoppers, 106 and a half. I'm taking the over there. And whoever the hell you are, Holton Allers, my man from ECU, the lefty slinger, uh, 78 and a half. I'm taking the over. Price picks, promo code Brooks today, 100% deposit match. Let's put it up there. All right. Welcome in today, boys. Before we get any deeper, how are we doing today? Doing fantastic. I mean, just preseason games. I know it's preseason games. It's not actual football, but any day that you can get football somewhat back, just a little bit closer, that's a good day in my opinion. Absolutely. Wrapping up the first week in the new studio, it's, it's been a grind, but we're good. Yeah, Thank it's you. been a grind, and it's been, it's, it's been a, a product of, of, of improvement, right? Constantly getting better and constantly figuring it out, right? Um, I think one thing that is often missed about our show, look, I'm not an audio technician. I'm just someone who's taught myself how to work with audio uh, techniques, okay? Um, these guys are not producers. They're learning how to be producers. These guys weren't even on-air talents before we went to Nashville, and I think they're doing a hell of a job. So, matter of fact, boys, uh, let's give them three. Um, we just gave ourselves three because that's how we're feeling about this week of content. I think what we are doing here is very unique. I, I don't know of very many shows that have in-studio uh, co-hosts that are switching back and forth, that have a big board over there, that are talking football, that you know have a, have a unique perspective on top of a unique presentation. So I've been proud of the product. I know it's been bouncing back and forth. I hope you guys at home have enjoyed it as well. And if you have, hey, hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Hey, for those of you, and you have been, for those of you subscribing in droves this week, despite all of the content, uh, you know, all the difficulties, if you will, hey, you're real ones, and I know you're going to be down with us for the rest of the time, and I promise you, only up from here, right? We're a rocket ship heading towards the moon. Um, speaking of giving three, we did have a press conference today, um, and I want to give you guys the opportunity. I know y'all went back and watched them. I know you sat there and listened to them, all that good stuff. Um, I want to get three observations from both of you real quickly about both of these press conferences, and quite frankly, I can't remember which one I gave you. So I had Dale McGee. And you All right, let's start with Dale. He went first today. Let's talk yeah, about so what, what Dale had to say. First take what I had from Del McGee was kind of an interesting thing I've noticed. It's the offense has changed, obviously. That's one of the big things we've talked about. But at the same time, it hasn't. He said, quote, things haven't changed a lot from a philosophical standpoint. So they're still grinding it out. They still have kind of the same mottos about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's just... Bobo's tweaking in a couple of ways. I think that's seeing scheming designs maybe tweak, but other than that, the overall change in philosophy, the way they go about things, yeah. isn't going to change at all, even though Mike Bobo's a new OC. I think one thing about that point that we've heard over and over this week is Kirby still likes it done the way Kirby wants it done. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later with some of these other coaches, but one thing I found fascinating about Kirby is that he entered this job as a micromanaging defensive mind. And now, eight, nine years later, he micromanages or is involved 
with the offensive game plan and with what the offensive decision making is as he is the defense because after all it falls on his shoulders so why shouldn't he be involved yeah exactly and then second second i had is cash jones is probably going to take some real carries real not not fourth quarter run the clock out carries like go in there and get us a first down type yeah. carries just because injury has been such a problem. That was my third observation is that it's a thin room right now. I mean, I feel like most of the questions he was answering were either about how Branson Robinson's dealing with his injury, how Kendall Milton's coming back from his, things such as that. So that's kind of plays into your worry Wednesday yesterday, but yeah. it is a thin room right now. I mean, I, he doesn't necessarily seem worried about it, but um, a couple of years ago he was looking at a room that, you know, couldn't get Brian Harry in touches, right? A couple of years ago, it was Swift and and Holyfield and and Brian Harry in and and guys like that. And now you look up and it's like, whew, you know, we might we might be our, our two deep might have a, a walk on on it entering our first game, depending on Kendall Milton's health. So, um, yeah, I I I hurt for Kendall, you know, like because mm-hmm. for those who don't know, I mean, it's been all soft tissue injuries, and that's nothing as a football player. I can't I can't out tough. A soft tissue injury. I can't just suck it up. I can't bite the towel. I can't do none of that stuff that just makes me, you know, a football player. Like just be tough. We can't do that with soft tissue injuries, and they almost ninety percent of them are, you know, just bad luck. You just you pop a hamstring, you pop a hamstring. It sucks too because we've seen in spurts what Kendall Milton does look like when yeah. he is basically borderline 100%. greatness. Yes, he is so consistently good in those spurts. It's like man, if he can just stick with it, if the health can stay there. Then we've got a great back. We have another Georgia great running back in that room. It's just, you know, you can't stay away from the injury bug, and I really hate that for someone like him. Yeah, I remember watching them back in 2020, his freshman year, thinking, who's this kid, Milton? Because you had Zeus yeah. and you had James Cook, and I remember thinking towards the end of the year that Kendall Milton might be one of the best running backs in that room, and he's just never been able to get that opportunity because injuries. Yeah, I was about to say, unfortunately, his freshman year was the most healthy he was, and then he ends up getting a knee injury against Florida, I believe it was, and then – and it tackled really, really awkwardly on that play. And then mm-hmm. after that, it's just kind of been really, really bad luck um, for Kendall. Hey, Kirby, give him three. Um, let's get to it. Give me the Mike Bobo three. Mike Bobo, the first one that I wrote down was his quote where he said, I wanted to go somewhere where I could continue to learn as a coach. Mike Bobo has been a coach since 1999. And so <laughs> he's been around football for a very long time. So the fact that he's still seeking growth, seeking places that he can improve himself, he specifically highlighted being to come in and work with Todd Munkin. That's very interesting to me, the fact that he's this far along in his career, but he's still searching for ways that he can improve himself. Mike Bobo, like Glenn Schumann, like Kirby Smart, like Will Muschamp, um, all sons of coaches. You know, my, Mike's dad is – was like one of the OG quarterback trainers that the state of Georgia has. In fact, that was like the original tie to Gunnar Stockton. Did you know Mike Bobo's dad taught Gunnar Stockton how to throw a football? This is a lifelong football dude. Like he loves football and he loves specifically college football. He's never even flirted with the NFL. Something I wish I had an opportunity to talk to him about today. But no, you're 100% right. He's, he's been a lifelong college guy and, and been sticking around for a long time. The second thing I wrote down, and this was kind of touched on in Todd Hartley's um, interview, but this one, when he it was brought up again today, when he said there are north of 20 UGA alumni working on that staff. And you hear a lot of the same sayings from some of the coaches of, I met my wife here. Yeah. My family loves the city of Athens. This is where my family is happy. And you know, those things might seem like minor details, but I think those things do matter when it comes to, especially in this type of culture of college football, when life is so hectic and things Get crazy that you do have your roots here and you have a place where you can just always be content i think the number the actual number is 26 26 staffers on their staff graduated from the university of georgia and by the way it's not just the staff it's my colleagues you know if you look around that room what of people asking kirby smart questions it's people who graduated from georgia you know i think the only one um and t- i mean chip's a lot older I don't, I don't know where chip's from mike a little bit older but like seth emerson's a maryland grad the rest of them, particularly all the young cats, all of them Georgia grads. So, like, yeah, there is a, a sense about Athens. You know, you guys go to school there. Y'all, y'all live there. Y'all understand what oh, it yeah. is. I've never been an Athens kid. I've, I've never been a Georgia guy. I just, you know, was gifted the opportunity to cover these guys. So when people ask me all the time, like, what's your favorite restaurant in Athens or where can we meet up for lunch? I'm like, dude, you got the wrong guy. I'm just, I'm just a, a, a passerby on this machine. There's just something in the water that makes you want to stick around. My last one, this one's a little bit selfish just because it kind of ties back to my own thoughts, but 
I love the comparison when he said Brock Bowers and Nick Chubb because he coached both guys yeah. at this point. I've also given the comparison just – kind of how they go about themselves, the quietness, the humbleness, but every single day you never have to worry about either one of them about how they're going to work. My favorite Nick Chubb moment is when he was on mic'd up and his teammate quoted it and said, you ain't going to hear nothing but that motherfucker breathing. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was a Just good moment. Just panting. The NFL.com actually mic'd up. I think his Nick one Chubb. quote in that whole thing was him saying, damn, I think yeah. that was it. Yeah, yeah. the other one is uh... – here you go, handing the referee the ball. Yeah, the, saying, here you go. Well, there's also a mic'd up one with the coach where it's, you know, we've got guys that are high maintenance, guys that are low maintenance, and a guy like Chubb is no maintenance. Yeah. And that's that's essentially what Brock Bowers is. I don't think you've ever heard any negative story about Brock Bowers. There was also a moment where uh, someone asked, how do you get the best out of Brock Bowers? And he's like, I don't get the best out of Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers does that every day by himself. I don't have to do <laughs> shit. Um, man, what a coach's dream, that guy, to be so uber talented. And never really having to like push him. Um, hey, Jonathan Williams, give him three. Um, it was an important one for me today, right? I mean, I obviously I, I love football. I love I love listening to football minds. We talk about this all the time on this show. Um, I gave you my thoughts last night on Georgia's offense. I told you they, you know, kind of have suspect talent. Now they don't have elite talent at the running back position, despite the fact. They have elite talent on the offensive line. They have a processor at the quarterback position. And they have a bunch of wide receiver talents that can get open and the best H tight end in football not named Travis Kelsey. That's what we put on the board last night. And we told you, hey, the offense should morph into a really good pass-protecting football team that runs a lot of horizontal concepts and you run to grass. That's what you should do. Um, it was interesting that we talked about that last night. Ultimately, to get Mike Bobo today, most of those questions posed to uh, – Mike Bobo, at least from my end, where, hey, how is this identity of an offense going to change? What's it going to look like? And how much of it was destined to change no matter what? I think there's going to be a lot of Georgia fans that watch Georgia play offense this year, and the first thing you're going to do is go, oh, well, that looks a little different. And I would tell you right now, if Todd Munkin were still the offensive coordinator, you would look totally different this year than you did last because your personnel is totally different. I want to play this clip for you of Mike Bobo answering this question today. It's going to be tough to hear me ask the question, but basically that's the question I pose. Hey, had some different guys that were very vital to your offense and how you played offense last year. They're no longer on the offense. How, is it, how was it going to change anyways, no matter what coordinator was at the position? This was his answer. Darnell plays such an impactful role for you guys. Sets of Bennett's ability is very different than maybe what you might be playing at the position this year anyways. How much would the offense have changed no matter the offensive coordinator change anyways? But, but I think each year uh, you try to figure out your identity uh, as, an, as an offense. And, you know, whether, you know, I was sitting there, coordinator of Coach Monk and came back, you got to figure out what, what pieces of the puzzle fit to what things that we did well last year, what are we going to have to change? Darnell was such a big impact for us. You know, not, not necessarily just blocking in line, but being able to block on the perimeter, uh, Stetson's ability to move. So we got to figure out the pieces that fit best for us offensively. And that's part of what fall camp is about. Day one in the first meeting, we talked about competition to our, to our players and, and building depth, but competition, not necessarily going against the defense, competition between uh, position groups. You know, there's competition between the tight ends and the receivers. Are we going to, you know, our tight ends going to step up? Or we can still be a lot of 12? We're going to have to be more 11. So those are things that you're figuring out through camp. And at the end of the day, you got to put the best guys on the field to give you the best chance to be successful. Uh, and then we want to build depth. If there's multiple people that can do multiple things, that increases our volume as an offense, more things that we can do. So we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, practice. We got a good feel for it right now, but we still got to go play on Saturday in a scrimmage and fine tune things the next, uh, you know, eight, nine days until the second scrimmage is over. All right. So there was a lot of information right there, but I, I highlighted three things even when I listened to it live. All right. He talked about the loss of two players, Darnell and Stetson, and he also talked about a battle between the wide receivers and tight ends that's going on right now in camp. Okay. Those kind of two or three things. That's what I want to explain to you. I've, I've heard people over and over again, myself included, talk about the impact of Darnell Washington without quantifying it to you, without showing you what it actually looks like in physical terms and what it feels like. So we have the ability to do that. Let's do it right now. Let's shut up and grind the concept, if you will. All right. So like I told you, we got a couple of questions to answer here for the University of Georgia offense, right? The first being Darnell Washington no longer being 
on the football team, right? So let's draw it up. Last year, they lived in 12 personnel, meaning they had an attached end-of-line tight end, that being big number zero. Sorry, my, my football drawing is very, very football drawing, all right? It's very, very raw. All right, they did a lot of keeping Brock Bowers. Let's make him detached, by the way. Excuse me. They did a lot of Brock Bowers playing off the line of scrimmage so they could put him in motion, right? They indicated a lot with Brock. But what they really were last year, what they really were last year was a counter football team. All right, they ran a lot of what I call traditional counter, GT counter, guard, pull kick, and tackle, pull wrap. All right, they ran traditional counter. But traditional counter is only as good as how good we are on the front side. What we're doing on the back side is all fugazi if the front side blocks don't matter. So most teams would line up with some type of, uh, you know, five technique right here. All right. They would put a three technique right here. They'd go a shade on the back side. Then they have an end, right? Have a mic and a wheel. That was kind of what the box looked like against Georgia last year on 95% of run plays, or at least the base personnel, if you will, right? So that makes this block right here. That makes this down block on this five technique incredibly vital because look here guys if we take this five technique right and we put him over here and we wash down all of this green grass and we create a nice big alleyway by zero moving this guy all the way over here then our down block on our front side of our surface has become much much bigger all right that's just counter right that's just running counter that's taking this big number y and having him wash down the entire side of the offense to where this whole unit now gets replaced over here. We've started a new surface over here. Now we're going to pull Xavier Trust. We're going to kick him out. We're going to bring Broderick Jones. We're going to run him right through this big old gap that Big Zero's made. Now, here was the problem for other teams. It wasn't just about counter. You heard in that quote right there, people talking about, or uh, uh, Mike Bobo talking about Darnell's ability to block in space. Well, here's how they really started messing with teams, right? I told you they'd keep Brock Bowers detached. They would have, you know, a Z over here, and then they have the X back here. This Z almost always being 84, right? How many times last year did you see Georgia motion into three by one, meaning they got three receivers over here, the tight end and two actual traditional wide receivers, and then run some type of tunnel this way, right? And throw Lad the ball out here in the tunnel. And now all of a sudden we got the H blocking, and this guy who was drawing all the attention into the box because he was beating the shit out of everybody in counter, all right, now this guy who's been doing this to us for however long and getting hella yardage and hella movement on this front side, now all of a sudden you're telling me he's going to go detach and be able to block the free safety that's running over into the alley to try to make this tackle over number 84. So as a defense, we have to not only attach safeties into the box, to account for big zero over here washing our entire front side down so the safety can now replace. But this big joker at 285 also detaches and blocks us in space and can unzip his feet when we come over the top. So there really was no way for teams to line up properly and attack this properly. So that brings us to our next discussion. You started hearing talk about Stetson. We'll save Stetson for last. While we're here, let's talk about Oscar Delp, this, this discussion about whether or not we're going to be in 12 or whether or not we're going to be in 11, and this idea that, that that discussion point ultimately comes down to a competition between the tight ends and the wide receivers. All he's saying, guys, is are we going to be more explosive playing a traditional Y, all right, and Brock Bowers over here in the A or at the H, you know, outside the ball, playing more of a wide receiver type, an H type, if you will, with uh, Lad McConkey over here, and whoever wins out at the Z spot, or are we going to be more explosive? Wait, yeah, that's eleven personnel. Are we going? That's twelve personnel. Are we going to be more explosive playing this guy in technically twelve personnel, but it's really eleven personnel because he's playing with the abilities of a wide receiver, but he can also attach right here. So are we better with that with four on the field? Or are we better off and more explosive as an offense? This is the debate going on right now in the room. Are we better off playing a move tight end in Bowers, right? And then leaving Rob Rod Thomas on the field or whoever's gonna, excuse me, whoever's gonna win the job at the X, right? Dominic Lovett in the slot and then putting Lad McConkey over here at the Z. I did that all backwards. Lad McConkey over here at the Z and whoever it is at the X, you get the point. Are we going to be more explosive with three receivers on the field, or are we gonna, and Brock Bowers at a traditional H tight end, or are we going to be more explosive and consistent as a 12 personnel team with Oscar Delt playing end of line tight end 
And, Os- and uh, Brock Bowers playing more of a mobile move tight end is the term nowadays in professional and college football. So that's the debate going on right now as far as what personnel packages are we going to live in as an offense. Now, the other discussion that they are having right now in the room is the loss of Stetson Bennett. The difference between Stetson Bennett's ability to move with his legs and Carson Beck's not necessarily inability to do so, but his non-ability to run like Stetson. So last year, we talked all the time about what we call around here manipulating the launch point, right? They would roll Stetson right, throw a ball from here. They'd take traditional five-step drop, throw a ball from here. They'd go RPO, run Stetson out the back, right? They would do a whole bunch of taking the cue and doing all kinds of stuff to where as a pass rusher or an edge rusher, right? If I'm an edge over here, I can't just rush to that one spot over and over again. Or I just can't rush to that one spot over and over again. I am being manipulated as the ball is being snapped, right? So we have a quarterback that strengths our pocket passing, right? If we're an offensive coordinator at the University of Georgia, that's what we have. We have a quarterback in Carson Beck, presumably, that we think is going to do most of his work from right here. Most of his dynamic work from right here. So last year, I just told you, they had to roll this guy a lot, right? That's why they only had seven sacks, because their quarterback was so mobile, they could throw from all different kinds of spots. Nowadays right? You're probably going to have to add in, whether it be uh, an H in uh, maybe Oscar Delp and stay in 12 personnel, whether it be keeping the running back in, we're probably going to have to do some type of edge manipulation, right? Knocking these guys in who are going to get real wide rushes to this consistent spot. We're going to have to get some type of chip, some type of edge, some type of bump to shove these guys back in because all we're doing now is now as an offensive line, We are creating much more of a traditional umbrella because our launch point, we know, is going to be far more consistently from there than it was outside the pocket last year. Does that make sense from everybody? Everybody got it? Yes, All right, there we go. Let me give you your pin back, bud. So there you go. Grind a little concept right there. Love it. I hope the chat loved it. Um, Yeah, so the offense is going to be subject to change anyways. Uh, I think you end up living in 11 personnel. I think Dominic Lovett's so daggum good. Uh, Rob Rob Thomas is going to ultimately be really, really good. Dylan Bell's really good, right? Lad McConkie, you know, is really, really good. Think of an opportunity to have much more strong uh, wide receiver unit than you have in years past. So I don't think there's necessarily a reason to be living in 12 personnel. Any questions, comments, concerns? Hmm. No, I think I'm good, actually. You seem like you had one. Do you think that Carson Beck does have enough athleticism to maybe become that of where he can be? A li- they can utilize him a little bit like they did Stetson, or do you think it's more oh, so? so this is the other thing I forgot. So, yeah, we can, every quarterback can kind of run to their right nowadays, or they at least should be able to. But the, the run game has now been kind of finagled, if you will, or messed with. Because last year, okay, if we had a running back on his left, this end had to play true to play what we call a surf player, right? There's a sprint on the front side, there's a sprint player, and there's a surf player. On the front side, we are, we are aggressive, right? We are trying to set the edge. On the back side, when we're the guy who's reading the mesh, if you play NCAA 14 or Madden, it's the guy with the R over him, that guy's a surf player. He's taught to surf down the line of scrimmage like that with his shoulders square. So this surf player is now no longer going to have to be that disciplined, right? This surf player, because he's not worried about a cue out the back, He's going to add in nowadays. So you're going to have to do a lot more split zone action, right? You're going to have to take this H and run him back this way and make sure that guy's accounted for. Or you're going to figure, you're going to have to figure out how to make this guy a surf player. You have to, and, and Georgia does a great job of doing a lot of uh, waggle, right? Slipping the H out of the back. You're going to have to make this guy accountable because he's no longer going to be hesitant on third and two with the quarterback keep. <laughs> I think that's probably also what's going into what's taking, quote, the quarterback competition so long to win over just yeah. because Brock Vandegrift and, to some degree, Gunnar Stockton provide you that extra where the end has to stay true and not and wait for the hold as much as Carson Beck's not Tom Brady-like, but mm-hmm. if Tom Brady's running read option, most of the time the end's just going to crash down. He's not going to yeah. stick out inside. So I think that's kind of what they're treating Carson Beck. If, Car- if Tom Brady opens up with his shoulder square to the defensive end, it's an automatic give. I'm telling you that right now. Um, no, you're 100% right. I, I don't know if he's ever given the option 
you know, because that's what it is. Like when we call plays in, there's a certain way to call inside zone and there's a certain way to call options. You know what I mean? Like it, it, most of the time it's, it's written on the card, OTG, or I don't know why I say OTG, ATG, automatic give. Um, I don't even know why I threw the T in there, but that's the way it was always written on our, our card sheets, ATG, automatic give. Um, that's not, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It, it, like I said, it was something that was going to happen anyways. That is not a Bobo change. That is a personnel change. And that's what coordinating is. Coordinating is, t- and, and you heard him say that, coordinating is taking the talent and putting it together, right? I think someone asked him a question today about concepts, and he said, you're asking the wrong question. We don't talk concepts. We talk players. Who are our best players? How do we get them to do the best job, right? And I've told you that on this network for a little while, Georgia fans that listen to us religiously. We've talked all the time about how Munkin was an NFL coordinator. NFL coordinators are based off what? Concepts. We run what we run because the 53-man roster is going to change over and over again. So we better have a consistent library of what we run. Whereas in college, Brock Bowers is so far and away better than anybody that they're going to play this year that they better be featuring him more than a typical Mike Bobo system would, right? Because it changes every single year. Your, your, your unique talents change every single year. So your offense needs to change um, every single year and match and maximize those talents. And, and that's what we've been preaching kind of this whole offseason with Mike Bobo as to why it seems like every year he's got a guy that he feeds a little more. When, he has, right. when he's got a top running back, he'll do that. Over at Colorado State, he had – I don't remember the receiver's name, but he was feeding that man. So At it, one point it was Michael Gallup who's with the Cowboys now. Yeah, exact, exactly. So that's kind of – Boa's always played to the strengths of his best players, not as much what concepts are running. It wasn't just Michael Gallup. They had 4,000-yard receivers in four straight years. Again, I, I wish I could just ask Mike Bobo questions over and over again because that was one I was going to ask. It's like, dude, you've got a career of making career years. Tank Bigsby, look it up. Best year of college football with Mike Bobo as his offensive coordinator. I believe that th- there's a stat that since Mike Bobo's arrival at Colorado State to now, they've had seven NFL draft picks and four of them came under Mike Bobo. Yeah. Yes, I mean, that, make, that makes sense. Anyways, um, they have a great ability to stack talent at the coaching position. And a lot of it has to do with Kirby Smart having developed relationships over years of coaching. And a lot of it's his buddies. And a lot of it's the fact that he coaches at the University of Georgia. And they happen to have a really uh, talented graduate pool of former, uh, you know, students that are now coaches out there. And they they all want to come back to Georgia. But it's not just his unique way of keeping talent on the coaching staff. Okay, He has a unique way of keeping uh, talent on the roster that isn't necessarily playing. And the way... He's gone about that, I have found this week. Another thing that we've learned is that Georgia has a very, very unique way of practicing. Um, I think it's, it, it was unique, all right? Georgia is not the only team that practices like this nowadays because teams are trying to practice like Georgia nowadays, okay? The game of football is so sudden, it's so fast, it's, it's intense, it's hectic. The only way to simulate that in practice is to constantly be moving. The program that I have witnessed most up close and personal because college programs don't give you this, that I know for a fact practices identically to the way Georgia does is Gainesville High School. Okay, Gainesville High School here in the state of Georgia is a program that is climbing up the ranks in 6A football without a lot of, you know, overwhelming talent compared to the rest of the the teams in 6A, right? They were in a seven-point game against Langston Hughes last year. Langston Hughes had about 20 guys on that roster. They're going to play Power 5 football. Gainesville had maybe three. All right, so they are coached really well. They practice really well. And here's what it's all about, okay? Every period at these programs that are practicing like Georgia nowadays is a compete period. Every period is high intensity. There is no teaching at all. There is all coaching and all playing. All right, now, if you've played any type of organized football, you understand that no teaching part, all right? Every program I ever played for, there was an extended indie period, individual period where coaches are just standing around, teaching the concepts and installing the concepts that we are going to run that day or that week for that game plan. There is none of that at the University of Georgia, at Gainesville, at any of these programs that are starting to practice like the University of Georgia that have witnessed what the results are from the way that they go about doing it. There are no water breaks. There are no 30-minute indie periods. There's no walk-through periods, and there's no install periods at these practices. For two hours straight, they're playing football, and they're going fast. All right, no two period, no three periods back to back. 
They spend 10 minutes doing something, boom, right into the next 10 minutes of doing something. It's full go, get your water when you need to. That's how these programs practice right now. And what is the result in that? Well, the result is that these football teams are ultimately prepared to play football because they practice football over and over again. They do not practice steps. They don't practice install. They don't practice the dumb shit. They practice football over and over again. They're physically prepared and they're mentally prepared. It also results in a really well-conditioned football team because you're not sitting around on a knee for 30 minutes of your two and a half hour practice waiting around for water or instructional period. But most importantly, the starters on these football teams, they feel as if they're getting reps and getting developed. You know why? Because they are. Right, Because they take multiple reps, they're constantly taking reps on this field, on that field. Take the JV unit down there, take the twos, take the threes, take them down there, get some good on good, bring them back when we want to go full team. That's what Georgia practices look like. That's what highly efficient football teams practices look like nowadays. Okay, If we were playing Family Feud on this network right now, the number one answer around that building as to why Georgia is different and why Georgia is successful, the number one answer on the Family Feud board would be, quote, it's the way we practice. The way we practice here at Georgia is different. That's what players will tell you. That's what coaches will tell you. That's what people who have witnessed it will tell you. The way we practice. That is the most important thing at the University of Georgia. And it's preached about over and over again. And by the way, I told you, it's being copied. People are taking it. Nebraska runs two different practices nowadays. Uh, I've heard of high school football programs that run two separate practices. They got a whole unit down there, offense, defense, special teams. They got a whole unit up on field one, offense, defense, special teams. Why? Because reps are king. If you're not getting reps, you're not getting developed. Boys, I, I know some of you play, you play basketball, you're a football guy. This idea of no water breaks, no rest, no nothing. We're just gonna compete, get after it, get water when you need it. But like, we're playing football today for two hours. That definitely never happened on the basketball court for me. Like, it may, I don't know, it, it, maybe it is a little bit different for basketball. Maybe it's not exactly comparative to it. But, I mean, there were, of course, times and moments throughout practice where it's like, okay, like, hey, when you're not on the court going through our scrimmage or whatever, like, grab you some water. But it's just, man, the way that Kirby Smart and that staff find ways to be efficient down to the second, down to the minute, it's just unreal. And I think it's why so many people are paying such close attention I, to what they're doing. I don't think there's a day that goes by where he doesn't think about how to improve the process. There's not. And I, I talk on this channel all the time about trying to learn something from people like this. There's a key to his success, man. He is obsessed. Like, he is so far obsessed and so far in love with what he is doing that it's impossible to hide, man. Like, we're going to talk about some coaches in the National Hour that could use some of this attention to detail across the board. We'll talk about it right now. Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley, I know you're great at offense. We, we got to be great at all of it, right? We got to be obsessive about all of it. There is not a day. There's not a day that Kirby Smart allows his program to not get better or not find a way to improve, almost to a default. He almost tweaks weight, almost too much stuff. Yeah, you can constantly tell his wheels are turning all the time. And I think it does weigh on him a lot, but it, it's working so far. I mean, the idea of no water breaks is definitely foreign to me. I don't know if GHSA would be all for that. I but, do. I do remember though when we do like team periods and install. Yeah. There wasn't. You had a water break. It was you come off. Twos go on. Ones come off. Get your squirt. They had. They had water girls Get and stuff squirt. like that. But and, that, that. and that's how it goes. I don't. I don't mean to say he, he he deprives them of water for two and a half hours. What I'm saying is they have at they have athletic trainers all all around the sideline, all around practice, all day long. Why in the hell are we breaking for five minutes so you can sit on a knee on the sideline and chug some water? Mm -hmm. That's some dumb shit. We're losing time. We only have so much time out here. We need to be practicing. And mm -hmm. I, I never even thought about that as a football player because I, I loved the water breaks. I loved five minutes off. I remember when you and I hit the road to a couple schools earlier in the year. It was like every practice we went to, especially after you went and visited Gainesville, you were just like, man. So much waste of time right here where guys are not getting reps. Guys are so uninvolved. There's so much that you could be packing into this one hour, but yet there's really not much going on. And a prime opportunity, especially like early in the springtime and whatnot, for you to be getting your football team better, get everybody reps, you're just not taking advantage of it. We it, left that practice that day, didn't we? We sure did. We got up and left because I, I don't like watching it. You don't even really think about it until like mentioning something like that. It kills the momentum of your practice. I can remember a lot of days where – it's 95 degrees and you get that water break and you're just sitting there and you hear that whistle blow and it's like, fuck, 
Oh, here we yeah. go. And you trudge back on the field. Whereas we, if you never stop working. You've yeah. got to avoid that. As a football coach, your job is to avoid that moment of, fuck. Or, or that moment of where your player's just, he's got his hands on his pads and he's just, he's just looking up and he's not paying attention and he's dicking around. Because guess what, coach? You've been over there talking to the starters for five minutes about running trap this week correctly and how we're going to block the three technique. Mofo, you had a whole hour of position meetings this week. What were you doing? And why are we teaching right now during practice? Why are we not practicing during practice? It's, it's, it is frustrating when you go walk around and you know, because like on the high school level, I know some of these coaches don't have all the resources that, they're, that they need to do this. They don't have the, the football periods. They don't have athletic administration giving them what they need. But on the college level, there's zero excuse. There's zero mm -hmm. excuse to not be dialed in and tuned in to absolutely everything that there is to be doing. Hey, there's a scrimmage on Saturday. Um, first scrimmage is all about figuring out who is truly, truly ready to go to war. Knowing Georgia, I highly doubt. Matter of fact, I can guarantee this is not the first time they've gone full tackle to the ground, whistle blows, like we're done. It's not the first time they've played real football. In fact, I would venture to bet there's at least 15 minutes worth of tackle to the ground every single day that they're in pads at the University of Georgia. That's the way that they do it. They play physically, they practice physically, um, but Saturday is more of a practicality. Saturday, in my opinion, is about finding out what I call confirmation, right? Coaches are looking for confirmation Saturday of what they've learned and what they already have in terms of preconceived notions after the first seven or eight practices of fall camp. They know, they're just going to know. Right, I used to have a high school football coach, Coach Dallas. We talk about him on this program every once in a while. Coach Dallas used to say, we think we knew, right? We think we knew we could beat that football team. Now we know, right? Coaches at the University of Georgia think they know who their starters are. After Saturday, they're going to know who their starters are. That's what Saturday is all about, confirmation bias and uh, confirming what they've already learned. Now, I, I kind of want to give you what Saturday's script looks like because other than being able to talk football, I think we have an ability and a very unique ability on this program to tell you what things are going to look like and feel like for players, even though we aren't there. I haven't seen a script for Saturday, but I've been through dozens and dozens of practice plans for scrimmage days. I know what this looks like. I know what this is going to feel like, and I, I can explain to you right now what's going to go down on Saturday inside of Sanford Stadium. First of all, they're going to get off that bus. They're going to go to immediately into flex. They're going to start stretching, doing all that good stuff, dynamic warm-up, moving and stretching. Then they're going to go into indies for about 10 minutes, right? They're going to go with their position coaches, going to go through steps, get generally warmed up, pop a little pads every once in a while. Then right after that, they're going to go right into one-on-ones. Offensive line, defense line paired up, going to get some pass rush, going to get some uh, run uh, board drill, some run blocks, some good stuff like that. During that time, wide receivers and DBs are going to be doing one-on-ones. Tight ends and linebackers are going to be doing one-on-ones. Running backs, linebackers are going to be doing one-on-ones. Safeties and tight ends are going to be doing one-on-ones. They're going to be competing, competing, competing. Right after that, after they do one-on-ones, they're going to get into what's called inside run and skelly. So you have a unit over there doing nine on 11, right? You got nine offensive players and 11 defensive players, and everybody in their mama knows you are running the football. That's why it's called inside run. We're going to set the tone, all right? While that's going on, skelly also known as skeleton, is going to be going on. Some people call this seven on seven. You're going to have seven defensive backs, uh, or five defensive backs, two linebackers, versus the seven skill guys from the offense. They'll play a little seven on seven. Then they'll go right into team good on good, right? Good on good. Ones versus ones. Let's get after it. Let's see what happens. Then they'll do some team one on two, right? My ones versus your twos. Then they'll do some team scout, right? Hey, I'm going to run offense. You run what UT Martin's running, or you run what South Carolina runs. Then they're going to do team good on good one more time, I would imagine, and call it a day. Scrimmage days, very nerve-wracking for people who are borderline, people who might make the bus, people who are competing for a job, people who are, have a job, but there's a guy sneaking up on them, right? Guys who can't prove that they're healthy and can't stay healthy. Can you survive a full scrimmage day of practice? Very, very nerve-wracking and unsettling unless you're a guy. And I'm going to tell you right now, until I was like a junior, senior in college, I, wasn't, I was never a guy. So Just even you talking about that makes you like, oh, damn, I remember that those days where you do that false scrimmage. It's like you're going to be a one or you're going to be a two. So I, mm. I totally get what you're talking about. Yeah, I, and the first scrimmage will be far more balanced in terms of reps than the second one. The second scrimmage will be much more about getting the true ones 
reps with one another. Um, Saturday will be, hey, you know, Brock, Gunner, y'all get, we've got to see tape of you with the ones and playing live before we actually make an evaluation of all this good stuff. So, yeah, Saturday, a very, very important day um, for everybody involved, particularly coaches. Is there anything you guys want to, like, when you read the nugs over on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin, make sure you're subscribing today. When you read the post scrimmage nugs on Saturday, what is something you either want to see or something, well, obviously you don't want to see any injuries. You don't want to see complete bill of health. But what's something you want to look to get answered on Saturday? I think I got two of them and like a minor third one. The first one, I want to hear some noise coming out of the offensive line of people not named Cedric Van Pran, Tate Rallage, and Xavier Trust. And maybe you can even throw Marius Mims in there. Mm-hmm. I want to find out who between Oshkin Blask, Ernest Green, Micah Moore, Dylan Fairchild, all those guys. Who's making noise on Saturday during that scrimmage? Second one I put ties into your concept of the day, Oscar Delp. We've heard a lot of stuff about how he has progressed this year throughout the offseason, putting on weight. He's gotten bigger. But how is he going to look in a first-day scrimmage and that number two spot now behind Brock Bowers? And can we really mix you in there along at the end of the line? Or how are we going to be able to utilize you this season? And the third one something about the quarterbacks because you know you talked it's about a big day between for yeah. borderline guys so maybe not even just specifically Carson Beck or just one singular guy but a big day for all three of them in general because someone's trying to take away and someone's trying to solidify a spot ahead of the other guy so any of them who's going to show up and basically ball out on a big day absolutely biggest one that I'm looking out for is Tyke Smith I've been really yeah. looking forward to seeing Tyke Smith since he transferred here back in 2021 He's never really gotten the opportunity just because injuries and depth charts such as that. I think how he does in the scrimmage is going to be very interesting to see if whether you know he's balling out at star or what the safety rotation even looks like at that point. The, uh, the next one I have is what's the running back room kind of going to look like? Obviously, it's not going to be exactly what it is in the fall. You've still got guys nursing injuries, but I do think it's going to be interesting to see how Cash Jones does. Does Roger Robinson look like he can take good reps at that position? And then finally, I kind of want to see what Ra-Ra Thomas is able to do. We've kind of mm-hmm. alluded to the fact that he hasn't been able to fully grasp the playbook. I think the scrimmage on Saturday is going to be a really good indicator as to is he making steps that he'll be ready in the fall come time where you throw him in at X. So those are three I'm looking forward to. I think Saturday, I wish I, I obviously wish I could be there for a multitude of reasons, but I wish I could like really, really be there for this one. When the defense starts to give the offense problems on Saturday, how quickly is Bobo to say, Ra Ra Thomas, get your ass in there. You know, we need a play to be made. Because from what I'm hearing, it's like we're kind of we're kind of waiting. We're kind of like waiting for him to be 100% ready. But the, the problem with that is like when you're a super, super competitive offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, football mind in general, when competition periods start to go around, man, like you want your best guys on the field. And from all indications, Ra Ra Thomas is one of the best 11 um, and is certainly one of the bigger playmakers on the roster this season. Do we have anything else, boys? No, do we not have a, any other film or something like that? Or? We don't have any more film. Um, I, I, I had one other thing that I wanted to talk about that I can't quite remember. Are there three things that you want to see from practice on Saturday? I want to see a clean bill of health. I, I certainly want to see Facts. a clean bill of health. Um, I want to hear about Georgia having problems running the football. That's what I want to hear about. Because that means that interior defense line is doing what I don't think it can do, which is hold up against the nation's best offensive line unit. George, if Georgia can't stop the run this week, it's not a big deal. It's not. But it will confirm what we knew, what we know, which is, hey, that interior of that defensive line, not quite filled with as many superstars as it has been in years past, and offensive line is great. That's what I want to know. And obviously, smile is out. So as much as development has been, with, there's been with Xavier Sori, Xavier Sori is very much so still a space player, not necessarily like the world's most refined uh, block reader and run gap filler at this point in his career. So I would imagine Saturday we're going to hear uh, there's been some run game success. So to kind of play devil's advocate to that, say Saturday comes and the report is, okay, Georgia's D-line, stop the run, shut it down. Would you consider that an indictment on the running back room? Because I know we've talked about how – that's kind of a shaky spot. Yeah. And it's always Kirby Smart mentioned this. 
defense does well, it kind of means your offense is doing bad. Offense does well, defense is kind of doing bad. I so. think that's what you have to kind of be careful with about scrimmages because you're not there to see it for yourself. Yeah. So, like, just because, like like you said, if, if it is that the running back couldn't get anything, you could take that as the defensive line showed up today and they did compete really well with the offensive line. Or you could take that as the running back room really isn't there yet. So it's kind of hard to just – you have to take things with a bit of a grain of salt. In my we're going to hear a lot about how he needs to check the tape. That's what oh, we're going to yeah. hear a lot about on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Well, I have to go back and look at it. I'll so have to go back and look this at it. This is kind of my opinion. You tell me what you think. I think scrimmages, like for in, inner squad scrimmages, are more for about assessing individual players, how this player did in this position, what's their grade here, instead of individual units as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, like you said – D-line's doing great. Oh, our O-line must have had a terrible day. Wideouts yeah. look great. Cornerbacks looked awful today. So I think it's kind of there's a thin line when you're watching where it's maybe, okay, Rara Thomas had a great play here, but Kamari Lasser's out of position. It's things such as that. So it's We've talked about how Kirby micromanages everything. The great thing about being a super smart football coach and going into a scrimmage like this, he can make whoever has success that he wants, really. If he really wanted to script it up the way he wants to, um, he can develop confidence in certain rooms. He can take it from some, right? It's as simple as, you know, making sure uh, play number 17 on the script just kind of puts the defense in a really bad position on their play 17 on the script. It's really that easy. It's, hey, we're going to call a blitz from the left side on play 17, and we're going to run stretch zone to the right on play 17 offensively, and then we're going to chew everybody's ass on the back side for not running. If you don't think Kirby Smart's smart enough to do that, what have you been paying attention to the last eight that's, years? That's that propaganda. Yeah, that's that That's that yellow journalism. Um, hey, appreciate you guys being here. Hit that thumbs up button. We'll see you in like five minutes over there on NBR. Love you. Hit that like button on the way out.